What a wonderful performance, huh? Stunning. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Natalie Dormer. It is a privilege to be here with you tonight to talk about what needs to be done to achieve gender equality, to empower women and girls in crises, and to prevent and respond to sexual and gender-based violence. Women and children form the vast majority of the world's 130 million crisis-affected people yet are still strikingly underrepresented in decision-making processes that shape humanitarian action. Crises hit everyone hard, but they hit women and girls differently and often disproportionately to men, largely because they heighten the pre-existing discrimination, marginalization, and exclusion that pervade already in societies. This means that when a crisis hits, girls are far more likely to be denied access to schooling and to, um, to their schooling and be put instead into exploitation, be it child labor or forced early marriage. It means that women and girls who live in fragile countries and already have poor access to reproductive and sexual health care, they face even worse odds in accessing the services that they need. It means also that women and girls face a heightened risk of sexual and gender-based violence with devastating impacts on their and their families' physical, mental, and socioeconomic status. When violence and natural disasters displace communities, every move that a woman or a girl makes can bring the risk of assault. At a border crossing, at a checkpoint, simply collecting water or firewood, or even in the very camps or settlements where they seek refuge. Now, of course, we must acknowledge that young men and boys can fall victim to sexual violence and horrific exploitation too. But in most of the conflicts around the world, rape has become a weapon of war, with women and girls directly targeted by fighting parties. Take the case of South Sudan today, where rape and gang rape is being used on a mass scale as a war tactic, an instrument of terror, in what can only amount to crimes against humanity. It is our duty as an international community to protect women and girls from such abuses. Now, of course, In rare instances, UN peacekeepers have been implicated in abuses. Now, the UN has a zero tolerance policy against sexual exploitation and abuse, and the peacekeeping department is working with troop contributing states to do better in vetting and the training of troops, investigations and disciplinary action. But each of these cases is an important reminder that we must all remain vigilant to spot and stamp out abuse wherever we see it, for we cannot allow the acts of a few to undermine the dedicated work of the vast majority. Now, vulnerable though they may be, even in the midst of these challenges, I am proud to say that women and girls continue to play a vital leadership role in their communities and in shaping humanitarian response. They are first responders in Yemen. They shelter the displaced in Niger. They set up communication networks in the Philippines and they coordinate aid deliveries in Nepal. And all over the world, they protect each other and care for their elderly, the children, and the sick. I am here tonight because I want a world where women and girls are free to live their lives without the threat of sexual and gender-based violence, and where perpetrators of sexual violence do not get away with their crimes. I am here 
because I want to see a world where crisis-affected girls and women can access the schooling, the reproductive health, the counselling services that they need to live healthy, productive lives. I am here because I want a world where women and girls can take on leadership roles to shape change on the issues that affect them most. We have learned through years of practice that programs are most effective when women and girls have access to medical, legal and psychosocial services. When we work with the judicial authorities to investigate and punish perpetrators. When we make reporting of assaults simple and efficient to reduce the stigma. And when we raise awareness of the problem across communities in schools, places of worship, the workplace and in the media. But importantly, very importantly, when we engage men and boys in the conversation, we are, after all, male and female together, a team, one species, one humanity. At the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul, Global leaders committed to build on those collective efforts I'm talking about by strengthening prevention and response to sexual and gender-based violence. Leaders committed to step up access to sexual and reproductive health and healthcare and ensure humanitarian programming is gender sensitive. The commitments were made I am calling on world leaders meeting here at the UN General Assembly in September to fully implement those commitments that were made in Istanbul and to make the participation and the protection of women the norm in all humanitarian action. As we pursue these goals, women must join their male counterparts standing at the helm, only by empowering women to take on the leadership roles at national, regional and international levels will we achieve the change that we so desperately need. Pledges are one thing, action is another. Leaders, it is time for action. Women and girls around the world are watching you. They deserve your help, they need your help and you can do something about this. There is no time to lose.